Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is David Sandalow. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. And today we are thrilled to welcome Eugene Linden to discuss his new book just out this week, uh, Fire and Flood. Uh, a few program notes bef before I introduce Eugene. This event is being webcast live. Uh, the full video will be available online in the coming days. Uh, for those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I, and our events are also, they're now closed captioned. Uh, you can turn the captions on by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting uh, show subtitles. Uh, as I said, I'm really thrilled to introduce uh, Eugene Linden uh, and thank him for joining us for this. Eugene is an award-winning journalist and author of more than a dozen books. Uh, Eugene wrote cover stories on environmental topics for Time Magazine dating back to the 1980s when print magazines were one of the main ways that people consume news. He wrote for Parade Magazine when that magazine was had the largest circulation of any magazine in the United States. He's been a leading environmental journalist in the United States and globally for decades. Uh, among Eugene's books that I highly recommend to you, if you haven't read them already, are The Octopus and the Orangutan and The Parrot's Lament, uh, both of which are <laughs> on a different topic that we're discussing today. They're on animal intelligence, but they're absolutely fascinating books. Um, Eugene wrote The Future in Plain Sight, which I took a look at. It's what, it's about two decades old, I think, and it's remarkably prescient look at the future. And then, for anybody who enjoys traveling, I recommend The Ragged Edge of the World, which is about Eugene's travels to some really remarkable places. Uh, and then so for, for reasons that we're gonna discuss in much more detail in the next hour, I highly recommend Eugene's latest book, Fire and Flood, uh, which looks at the history of climate change from 1979 to the present. So to, here's what we're gonna do today. Eugene's gonna start with a few words about the book, then he and I are gonna have a dialogue about some of what he wrote about. Uh, and then throw it open to you for questions. So you can submit questions at any time in the Q&A uh, tab below. And with this, uh, let me turn it over to Eugene. Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. I'm delighted to be here, David. Thank you for that very nice obituary. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm sure there are some in the audience who have got a deeper knowledge of the science than I do. Uh, than I do. And I, uh, my uh, interlocutor, David, has a deeper knowledge of the policy. If I have any um, extra sauce bringing to the party on climate change, I've been writing about it for a long time, and since the late 80s, in fact. Um, and my book addresses one major question, which is how is it that the world has remained paralyzed in addressing climate change? So let's drop back a little bit. 1993, I wrote an article for Time on why the world delayed action on chemicals destroying the ozone layer until long after the ozone layer had formed. Um, to give a little background on that, I mean, I think it was 74, uh, Mario Molina and, and Sherry Rowland uh, first put out, uh, published that these chemicals, the CFCs, could destroy the ozone layer, uh, uh, destroy upper atmosphere ozone, which protected Earth from uh, UVB radi radiation. We started it, uh, a move towards banning the chemicals. Um, and in fact, we're going towards a complete ban when Reagan was elected. And then all of a sudden, um, he dropped uh, any of the momentum on that. And then the ozone hole was discovered by Joseph Farman in uh, 1981, 82, the first readings. And it wasn't until 1987. Well, one of the reasons that it was uh, that we banned the chemicals, one of the reasons that occurred, it took so many years, was that industry had basically perfected a playbook actually uh, to try and stop regulation of tobacco. And they used that playbook um, to try and delay regulation on, on OZA, on CFCs. And the playbook was um, dispute the science, say we need more study, uh, demonize the scientists, um, say they had mixed motives, um, say there was no consensus, et cetera. Um, at the end of that article, um, and, uh, and by the way, we would never probably wouldn't have had a, uh, a ban on the chemicals had not the leading manufacturer of those chemicals um, been DuPont, which controlled also had started uh, research on the alternative chemicals and realized that if there was a ban, they would have a lead in uh, commercializing the alternatives. So 
that story was taken to be a major environmental success story. Um, but I looked at it from another perspective, which is that many uh, millions of uh, pounds of those uh, ozone destroying chemicals went into the atmosphere long after we knew that they were a threat to indeed life on Earth itself. Um, and I ended that piece wondering um, whether corporate forces would mobilize to gum up the works on climate change, just as they did for ozone, since climate change was a far more complex problem with almost all human activities contributing to it, um, and uh, it would be far harder to solve. Well, and we now know the answer. Um, 30 years after uh, that article, um, greenhouse gas emissions are about 60% higher than when climate change first was identified as a crisis. Um, so let's go back. Um, warmest years started coming in the 1980s, um, and, but they were uh, dismissed uh, as a, because it was hard to separate the noise from the signal. Uh, by the 90s, of course, we began to realize that there was uh, unusual warming, uh, global warming. Um, let's, right now, we know that business as usual is likely to lead to something like three degrees centigrade Celsius warming over pre-industrial levels. Um, to put that in perspective, that kind of, that degree of warming has not been um, on, on the planet since the Pliocene. Uh, before the ice ages, um, there was plenty of life back then and plenty of apes, but there weren't any humans. We obviously, we cannot let this happen, but we've almost, we've done almost nothing to stop it from happening. And in fact, it's gonna be vastly harder to do something now than it was 30 years ago. So keep in mind, 1990 global population was 5.3 billion. Today it's 7.8 billion. That's two and a half billion people added to the population since we first began to talk about taking action on climate change. The average uh, per capita emissions per person globally is about 4.7 metric tons. In the US, by the way, it's 20 tons per person. That's over 10 billion, 10 to 12 billion additional tons of emissions <clears throat> that have to come back, come out of the atmosphere that we're generating annually just to get back to what we were facing in 1990 when climate was already beginning to change. So let's briefly unpack why we didn't um, take action. You know, I argue that the battle was lost in the 1990s. Um, and the reason I do that, by the early 1990s, people knew a lot about how climate changed. Um, in 1993, <clears throat> for instance, um, Science and Nature published articles um, from the uh, ice core programs, the GRIP2 uh, GISP, GISP and GRIP, uh, European and American ice core studies of uh, ancient climates that showed for the first time definitively that um, climate change was not a stately and gradual process, what you might call a dial, but rather that past climate changes had been very violent and very rapid indeed. This is fundamental and important. Um, and uh, it was a revelation. It took, for the, so that's 1993. Um, when I went to Antarctica in 1997, that idea of rapid climate change, which was important to what we were doing now, by the way, um, was still, something of an outlier. It wasn't until 2003 that the National Academies of Science published uh, uh, a study saying that there had been a paradigm shift in understanding climate and that, um, to put it in metaphorical terms as Richard Alley did, it wasn't that climate change like a dial turning, but rather like a switch. What that meant was that if climate could change rapidly, um, you might not be able to get ahead of the changes um, if, uh, if you were forcing the changes. All right, so also back then, economists and policymakers knew that in China and India, India industrialized with coal, it might moot all the developed nations' efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. We knew enough to take action. Um, and what we discovered is that the science and experts don't determine what happens, what does. I use the example of George H.W. Bush. Uh, 1988, he's running for president. Um, and um, he uh, is... Uh, in a speech uh, in 88, he talked about the greenhouse effect. And he said, those of you who worry about the greenhouse effect, don't, you should think about the White House effect. And he vowed to have a conference on climate change once he was elected. Well, somehow, sometime between when he ran for office 
And when uh, he got in office, the lobbyist effect came into play. And uh, yes, he did have ultimately have a conference, but it was a conference on climate change where participants couldn't mention global warming. Um, as he was, uh, uh, business interests got to him and said, you cannot do this. Um, it's almost as though you had a conference today on pandemics and couldn't talk about COVID. And then again, um, at the Rio, the first uh, Earth Summit in Rio um, was intended to address climate change as well, but energy somehow dropped from the conference agenda. And it wasn't until years later it got back on. So recall that a business organized to delay action on climate change. With climate change, they not only mobilized, but blitzkrieged, um, and far more effectively. And they use that same playbook. But the most, apart from demonizing the scientists, questioning their motives, the most important thing they could do was say, we have time. And unfortunately, the science and policy community private provided them pl with plenty of admission, uh, ammunition to delay, delay action. Scientists, of course, are loath to go beyond the data and moneyed interest exploited this masterfully to, set, to suggest that we had plenty of time to act. Um, and we can talk about this later, but one vehicle was the IPCC, that massive consortium convened to assemble the state-of-the-art science. Um, so the other thing that happened was that back then, the uh, original IPC reports saw only modest changes uh, over the next decades. And this, of course, was exploited by the scientists. Um, for instance, um, tipping points beyond which you get these feedback loops that make climate change impossible to control. Back then they were thinking we needed a five degree warming Celsius in order to have a tipping point. And now of course the figure is now two degree warming um, and as low as one degree in some studies. So back when we could have been doing something, everybody said we have time. Not only do we know now that we don't have time, we also know that we're perilously close to pushing the system into an unstoppable feedback loop. When we could have incentivized China and India to leapfrog coal, we gave them mixed message, messages and they use coal. And throughout this period, the public remained ignorant. Um, there was a study in the early, uh, let's see, I think it was the late 90s, where they uh, polled the public and saying, what is the leading cause of climate, climate change? And the answer back then was the ozone hole, um, which is totally wrong, but totally logical. If there's a hole in the atmosphere, maybe uh, heat comes in. Um, but they put together the, the, the fear of the day with another fear of the day, climate change, and that was the answer. You'd think that after scores of cover stories and studies and specials and conferences, 26 conferences, that the public would be better informed. Well, two years ago, Gallup did a similar study. Um, and uh, they uh, said, what is the leading cause of, uh, what is the leading cause of climate change? And the leading answer was plastics in the ocean, which of course had nothing to do with climate change, but again, was in the news as an environmental crisis. So to tell this story of, of how we got to where we are today, I use a device of four clocks. It's basically four different realms. There's reality, which is what has actually happened. It's science, which has a structural lag of a couple of years to reality built in because you have to gather data, you have to analyze it, you have to uh, then have it peer reviewed and published. Um, the public, um, which has been decades behind the scientists, um, and the last and probably most understudied and most important was this, the realm of business and finance. Um, and the past 30 years have shown us that the way we do business is the problem and stands for business as usual are such that we are essentially blind to long-term threats such as climate change. That has to work, business as usual won't work. The bottom line um, of everything, of course, is that if we don't wean our economy from fossil fuels, climate change might well mean uh, wean us from our food supply. Um, and with that, um, David, let's talk. Well, great, Eugene, thank you for that. And I think that, that those brief remarks just really underscore uh, first Eugene's vast depth of knowledge on this topic. And, and his history with it. And um, it, it's really a good summary of what's in the book. And I, and I highly recommend it. And the device you mentioned, you, you talk about the, the four clocks, kind of what's actually happening with climate change, what the scientists are saying, um, what the public knows and what the business and finance community are doing. And I just found it a really helpful way to understand the past several decades of, uh, of climate change history. And 
it also reminds me, Eugene, that I, in, in uh, your bio, I, in, in telling the audience about your bio, I forgot to mention um, that you, in addition to being an author, you've also worked as an advisor to an investment firm, a strategic advisor and investment firm. Um, and so you really have a pretty rare combination of, of knowledge about the environment and finance. And, and I, I wanna come back to that um, because I think the mobilization of capital is an incredibly important part of the solution to climate change. Um, but first, let me just start with a really big picture question. Um, why, like, why did you write this book? Why, why you got lots of things you could be writing about? Why did you think that this was a priority for for you? Well, there's 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 two answers to that. One is the, my motive. Um, I felt like years from now, when my great grandchildren are living in caves, I might peer out and want to know, you know, how did we blow it so badly back then? Back then, you know, what was it? Why didn't we take action? But the actual trigger for it happened a couple of years ago. Back in 1993, I wrote an article for Time Magazine about the insurance industry and climate change. And I figured in that article that they could be the white knight because they're acutely sensitive to pricing risk. You don't price risk right, a, an insurance company is gonna go broke and then climate change of course was a global risk. And indeed the reinsurance age uh, the, reinsur the reinsurance side of the insurance industry, that's the, those are the big companies that take up catastrophic risk, have been terrific in uh, studying climate change, trying to understand the economic risks and everything else. Um, but it turned out that the industry has been a very timid white knight. Um, um, they uh, retired from the field of battle early. <laughs> um, the, and then a couple of years ago, um, I was reading about the uh, fires, the, I think it was the Camp Fire in, in, in California, which did about $12.5 billion in shared losses and damage. And the head lobbyist for the California insurance industry was saying, yeah, we're all scrambling to figure out this new risk from climate change. And I said, what? Um, <laughs> You've been studying the issue for 30 years, having wonderful conferences, writing these grand studies. I wrote one of the studies for them. Um, how is it that this is a surprise? And what I realized was I'd made a couple of mistakes back in the early 90s. One is I'd forgotten insurance as a business um, and that they make their money by writing policies. In other words, there's tremendous momentum to writing policies. Um, and two, I'd underestimated their genius at spreading and camouflaging risk. Um, not spreading, offloading, not camouflaging, offloading and spreading risk. Risk gets camouflaged by the underpricing, but it's the offloading of risk and the, and the spreading of it that leads to the underpricing of it. Um, and their ingenuity in that. And then thirdly, uh, going back to it being a business, I realized that the incentives, the way the industry instructor is, is structured, the incentives at the retail end of writing policies is always to write policies so long as somebody will backstop them. And so because the, the broker realizes that the, the risks are probably in the price or they're supposed to be, and they get paid, their profit sharing and bonuses come from a retrospective. In other words, if you don't have a disaster up until this year, you're gonna get a good bonus if you're writing a lot of policies, even if next year there's a hundred year flood or a fire in California, et cetera. And so the incentives, actually overpowered the, uh, uh, back in 94, Frank Nutter, the head of the Reinsurance Society of America um, said, yeah, we recognize this is an uh, existential risk of bank, it could bankrupt the industry. They kept writing policies and they kept underwriting coal companies until just a, co a couple of years ago. And without uh, the underwriting and the reinsurance on the coal policies, um, uh, uh, coal, uh, coal fired plants, you're not gonna get coal fired plants built. So, um, even though they understood the risk, the incentives in the industry um, were, were such that um, they continued to write policies. And, uh, one other thing, in most insurance policies renewed on an annual basis. So they always had this uh, get out of jail free card where they could just either raise prices dramatically or if the regulators didn't write them, get out of the business altogether, which is what they did in Florida. Um, and then of course, what happened um, when Hurricane Andrew, I'll give you an example. Hurricane Andrew did $50 billion damage in 1992. About a dozen insurance companies were uh, rendered insolvent. After that, the reinsurance side said, gee, 
um, we either have to get out of here or we have to offload some of this risk. A guy named Everhard Muller at Hanover Ray in Germany came up with this brilliant idea of what's called a cat bond. And these are bonds that pay a very high interest rate. And what you're doing is you're, 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 when you buy that bond, you'll get to say 8% or so. And you're saying there is not gonna be a category five hurricane that hits Miami in the next three years. Well, even if the risk of a category five hurricane is doubled from one in a hundred years to two in a hundred years, it's still only one in 50 chance that it's gonna strike in any given year. And so you could invest in this bond, get a high rate, and all you had to do is hold your breath for a couple of years, and then you uh, you do it. The, the other thing was that it was attractive to institutional investors because it's a called uncorrelated. In other words, you invest in a cat bond, you're going to get paid if there's not a hurricane. It doesn't matter if the market falls apart or interest rates uh, you know, go kablooey, you're going to get paid. So it's uncorrelated to other returns. It's very attractive to institutional investors who like to um, have a portfolio or a spread portfolio, risk portfolio. But what it did for the insurance company was it unlocked hundreds of billions of dollars <laughs> of potential capital to take some of the risk off them um, and enabled them to keep uh, insuring these risks. And other things happened as well. For instance, after Andrew, insurance companies started pulling out of Florida for uh, wind risk. The uh, flood risk is of course federal at federal level. Um, and so in, in 2002, Florida uh, picked up a, uh, all the uh, wind risk um, in what was called Citizens Property Insurance Company. Um, and that um, all of a sudden in a few years, they were the largest insurer for wind risk in Florida. And what that told you was they were underpricing risk for wind because if they uh, if, if there were competitive pricing, of course, major insurers would have uh, still been in the game. Um, and, but what it also meant was that, you know, poor people in the middle of Florida were willing to accept a risk uh, for that uh, they would, would ultimately fall on their shoulders should, they, should this underpricing come to fruition. In other words, should there be a major hurricane and citizens went bankrupt, it would be on the taxpayers of Florida. Um, and the results of this underpricing of risk have been astonishing and, and we'll tee up something for later in the conversation. But what, what that meant was millions of people have moved into harm's way who might otherwise not have moved into harm's way had the risk of climate change been priced in, both in California and the fire zones, Oregon and Washington too, flood zones elsewhere in the country um, and coastal zones, particularly Florida. I mean, it's astonishing. 80% of the insured property in Florida is in the coast now, in the frontline coast. Um, and uh, millions of people have moved in, which is astonishing because even there have been many other hurricanes that have hit the region since. And I, more and more insurers have pulled out, making citizens insure the major insurer in the state. And so the socializing of risk has also led to this underpricing. I thought this was one of the most fascinating parts of the book, Eugene, and, and it's an analysis that I haven't seen elsewhere looking at you know, what, why the insurance industry has not actually taken the risk here, why it hasn't served as an effective buffer in some ways against some of the um, uh, building that related to, to climate change. And, and one, one question about this, I mean, do you see comparisons between what's happening uh, here in what you were just discussing and, and the uh, global financial crisis from 2008, 2009 period? Absolutely. I, I happen to have a front row seat at that because um, I've, I, you know, I mean, to put this anecdotally, I mean, earlier, I, I'd had a hard time getting a writer before a uh, uh, mortgage before I worked for the hedge fund. But um, all of a sudden, people were giving me mortgages. And I said, wait, this is what's wrong with this picture. And then I, what you realized was they were offloading the risk. Um, in other words, if the banks had held the mortgages, they might have been more stringent about the underwriting criteria for giving a mortgage. And so what this did was a, a home ownership in, 60, uh, in 2007, 2008, um, typically it had been 69, 65% of the population. All of a sudden, it's up to 69% of the population. That meant that 4% of the population were getting uh, mortgages who pro probably couldn't repay them. And the reason they were getting these mortgages is because the banks would then sell them into these big time securitizations. All of you who saw the big short. Well, I saw this and we did one of those things at the hedge fund. And um, even though we did it very small, it was extremely profitable. But what it told me was that um, 
you know, subprime was only 5% of the mortgage market, but it caused a global financial crisis because of the tight couplings up and down the chain. Um, to be specific on it, and I'll, I'll take just a second on this, these are these billion dollar securitizations made up of mortgages. The key to the whole thing was what was called a mezzanine tranche, um, which was allowed to say uh, the bottom 2% were equity, and then there'd be two or 3% of this mezzanine tranche. If, unless you could sell that, you couldn't put together these structures and they couldn't sell the mortgages. But so they set up a securitization that took all these mezzanine tranches and put them in another billion dollar securitization. What that meant was that if home prices fell four or 5%, which they hadn't since World War II or before, that billion dollar securitization was worth zero and many of the other securitizations other than a sudden weren't worth anywhere near um, what they were. And that's the thing that actually caused this daisy chain of reactions and all the counterparty risk. The analogy for climate change is this. Um, if you're in uh, what happened in California after, you know, uh, fire after fire after fire after fire, is that all the insurers um, said, okay, we're out of here because of the one year renewal. The state of California said, oh, no, you're not. Um, you're a regulated industry that will put a moratorium on this. And the moratorium was for a year. A year later, they say, we're out of here. And they left. And I happen to know of a couple of examples where um, the, um, um, in the going for a, a private policy after AIG, for instance, larger insurers in the state pulled out, um, the premium, the, the deductible went up by a factor of 10 and the premium went up by a factor of 10. Mm. Um, and, and in many cases, people couldn't even get insurance. Well, that's okay if you're super rich, you know, and you're living on the coast. But let's say in the fire zones, in um, many of the fire zones, it's middle class. If you can't get insurance, um, you, you know, you can stay in your house, keep paying your mortgage if you have one. But let's say you're an empty nester and you want to downsize. Let's say you're retired and you want to downsize. Let's say you die and your kids want to sell the house. The person buying that house is likely to want to have a mortgage. And if they can't get a mortgage, um, they ca can't get fire insurance, they can't get a mortgage. And so you set up a situation where there is the potential um, for a 2008 kind of crisis, um, not just in California, but in other harm, uh, zones where insurers will pull out, but the buyer either can't get insurance or there is no buyer because they don't want to take the risk. Um, and that might happen in a couple of days, given all the confluence of various aspects of climate change between temperature and floods and winds, et cetera. Um, and that sets the stage for a financial crisis like, if not more intense than 2008, but one which is not be a one-off. 2008, we could come back because it was essentially a financial event. Um, and it, um, once you could deal with the bad debts and things like that, the undertaker beetles of the finance system would clean it up. And, and then of course we get going again. But the, the circumstances that will cause its uh, parallel in a climate change financial crisis are not gonna go away because once they happen, you can expect that next year is gonna be worse and the next year is gonna be worse after that. So, I mean, that is the way in which uh, a global warming might become a financial crisis um, and, and one that it may not be in the too distant future if we don't do something about it. I wanna move on to another topic, but we have a, a really good follow-up question here from Amanda DeSantis who, who says, if you had a wish list, actions would you want insurance companies to undertake? Any quick thoughts on that? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, we're so far down the pike. You know, 30 years we've been underpricing this risk um, and millions and millions of people have moved into harm's way. Um, the private insurance markets, you know, probably can't, raise rates enough because it, it, this is also an equity problem. And I'm sure um, your, your questioner knows this answer. And that is like, for instance, in, in Florida, in the Florida Keys, um, it lives and dies by the tourist industry. You need workers for the tourist industry. If you actually priced uh, insurance, wind risk and uh, flood risk in the Florida Keys for the actual risk, you wouldn't have any service workers in the Florida Keys and the economy would collapse. So it, there's no easy answer to that. I mean, the insurance companies are beginning to price risk, um, but uh, look at it, 10 times the premium is not a way to solve this problem. Um, 
it's uh, you, we need an orderly, we, we, need, we need demographic shifts. And I'll, 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 I'll add one more layer to this. The Rhodium Group and ProPublica and the New York Times did a study of every county in the United States. For, and they took about five different types of climate risk, um, wet bulb temperatures, actual temperatures, flood risk, wind risk, um, and uh, fire risk. And then they aggregate these factors and they give a score for every county in the United States. And what they discovered is in about 20 years or so, there's gonna be a lot of counties, some of them, some of the richest counties in the country that will be uninsurable and unlivable in some cases. And the question is if your county is unlivable because of wet bulb temperatures as in some counties in Louisiana and then the uh, South Carolina coast or, your, uh, or because of floods, who do you sell your house to? So uh, it's an extremely daunting problem, but what we need is an orderly and what we could have had had we begun action in the 90s was an orderly demographic shift away from some of these zones. Um, we haven't had that, but we, it, it, we better start soon. And I think the process is already beginning because I have a feeling that um, pricing is gonna be the trump card of climate change. In other words, it's going to, as prices, be, as costs begin to come into the economy, and I can give you figures on that. Uh, the first uh, decade of the economy, Aon came up with uh, $1.5 trillion for give or take uh, for weather uh, weather related uh, uh, insured losses or losses around the world. Um, the figure for the next nine years, not even the full decade was three over three trillion dollars. As those costs come on, they are going to be passed on one way or another. I give the example of PG and E. Uh, the, uh, you know, who knows what the fires you know, caused, uh, they may have contributed to fires, right? Um, up in uh, the, uh, the uh, Northern California fire. Um, and so everybody, you know, is suing them right and left and uh, says they ought to pay. Well, then they, what happens? You declare bankruptcy and of course, um, uh, the, the whatever new regime providing electricity is going to pass the, uh, the costs on to uh, the um, uh, taxpayers or the rate or the, or the homeowners, or um, the state takes it over, in which case the costs are going to be passed on to the same people. So the costs are going to be passed on and they're going to be shifted and ultimately end up um, either with the taxpayers or, or, or the homeowners or whoever. Um, so these costs are going to come out and I think they're going to change a lot of not minds about whether or not climate change is real. Uh, Eugene, let, let's move to another topic, which I found fascinating in your book, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. All right. yeah. And I just for our audience, you know, many people know this well, but for those who don't, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a group of hundreds of scientists, maybe thousands that have uh, put out six comprehensive reports, I guess, in the past 30 years. Or, um, yeah, we're on the 6th in September. Yeah. And and it just in the past couple of months has put out uh, uh, one major study on how to mitigate climate change, another on the impacts of climate change. But I find it very interesting, Eugene, you were, in your book, you're quite critical of the IPCC and, and its work, particularly in the early decades. And right. could you just elaborate on, on why and your thoughts about the IPCC? Yeah, absolutely. But let me bracket that by saying that the, lately, the IV, in the last few years, the IPCC has been doing exactly what we'd hoped it did at the beginning, which is sounding the alarm. And that this latest report, you know, uh, Guterres of the uh, UN is basically his hair was on fire when he talked about uh, you know his findings. Um, so, but the Secretary General of the UN. Yes, right, exactly. Um, uh, but back at the beginning, the IPCC was formed what is it, 87, 88, was supposed to aggregate the best science and bring in all the various components or actors involved with climate change, including policymakers, which was a huge mistake. Um, and that opened the door. Um, keep in mind, these reports are several thousand pages long, right? One section, for instance, of this latest report, which I was looking at impacts yesterday, it's 3,765 pages. Now, most policymakers aren't even gonna, they'll read the uh, um, summary for policymakers, which is 40 pages at the beginning of the thing, but it doesn't get into depth. So what the, the those who would delay action, what they realized was that one, they took advantage of the scientists' inherent caution um, and always wanting to gather and not being reluctant to go beyond the data. Um, and then secondly, um, they realized that people only read the uh, um, summary for policymakers at the beginning of these big reports. Um, and in fact, probably uh, most politicians only read the press releases, which are very shorter. Um, so 
if you could interfere with that and mute, roll, mute the edges of that, you could go a long way towards saying, you know, yeah, we, this could be a problem down the road, but we got plenty of time. And that's exactly what they did um, because the chapters in these reports are usually very good, straightforward and honest and contain fantastic amount of inf useful information. The summary for policy makers, not so much. Um, and particularly in the early reports, for instance, um, in the 1990 report, which was the first assessment, um, it basically said, uh, gee, the ice sheets might actually grow. Um, there may not even be loss of ice. It had nothing to say really about the permafrost in the executive summary, of course, summary for policymakers, because there wasn't anybody monitoring the thing, even though scientists knew at that point that if the permafrost melted, you, there was billions of tons of greenhouse gases um, locked in there and that if it melted, of course, they could be released. Um, and so, it, and, and on sea level rise, it was all over the map. Um, and so, and also there was a lot of talk about the thermal inertia of the oceans that delaying any signal of climate change. Um, so here's what, I'll give you an example of what happened. A, a very distinguished Yale economist named William Warren Nordhaus looked at the summary of policymakers, and then he, he thought, well, how am I gonna price in the risks of climate change for the future? He came up with this uh, model called DICE, but in any case, he started writing papers about what the likely cost would be to the US economy in 2100. One of his papers, it was a quarter of 1% of GDP. And he explicitly said, we don't have to act now because the thermal inertia of the oceans is gonna delay any signal of climate change well into the next century. And then he had what, in retrospect, and even back then, should have looked like the most absurd thing statement ever made by an economist, which is that because 87% of the economy is indoors, the US is likely insulated from most of the effects of climate change. Tell that to the port of uh, Los, uh, New Orleans, tell that to Houston after hurricanes Harvey and Katrina, you know, where uh, tell that to any business that was in the fire zones in California or PG&E, for instance. Um, and in any case, then, and he publishes this paper, big time Yale economist, William Niskanen of the Cato Institute testifies to Congress and he says, well, you know, this may or may not be a problem for the future, but the clear message is we have time to figure this out. Um, and so the IPCC really was not helpful back then. And, and indeed, this exploitation, because there are a lot of players in the, in the I'm diverging a bit, you know, it's enormous, the IPCC. It's, uh, you know, all every country on earth has representatives. They're all contributing. The policymakers are all contributing. Many of them, Saudi Arabia, others, don't want any action on climate change. And it became the perfect vessel for uh, sort of dampening the message. And uh, in the book, I actually quote from the last paragraphs of the uh, of the first IPCC uh, uh, summary for policymakers, we, th this far from a call to action as anything you could ever get. This continued until 2007 when it was, the, I think it was the fourth, yeah, the fourth report. Um, and there was a huge blow up in that report because it was, uh, they weren't accepting real data on what the contribution of the melting of the ice sheets were to sea level rise. Even as, um, the um, contributions were 40% of existing sea level rise at that point, and it was accelerating. And the reason they didn't was that um, they couldn't, they, they would, wouldn't admit what are called semi-empirical models, which we won't go into. Um, in any case, the scientists were livid. Um, many of the climate modelers were livid, and uh, but the report actually lowered estimates of sea, future sea level rise, which of course, was taken up by anybody that deniers who said, well, you see, um, they overstated in the past. It's not really as much of a problem. Of course, even the numbers they gave would have been a big, big problem. Since that time, they have gotten, with, gotten religion on this issue and realized that they were being used, I think, that it took uh, 17 years to figure that out is a story for another time. But um, the, uh, I think there's, so there's two different IPCCs. They weren't helpful when we needed them. They are helpful now and we still need them. Indeed, we have a lot of great questions in the chat. And, and for okay. those listening, just a reminder, uh, I, my name is David Sandalow. I'm at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I'm here with Eugene Linden, whose new book, 
fire and flood is just out this week. And I assume you can get copies on Amazon and, and in your local bookstore. Um, uh, Eugene Linden's book, Fire and Flood, is our topic of conversation. We have uh, a, a Colleen uh, McGarvey asks, um, uh, whether you have any advice for journalists uh, covering the climate crisis today? Um, well, I, I, that's one of the good things that's happened is that is it, it's now a major story and there are tons of good journalists and tons of journalists, ju uh, good journalism being done on the issue. Um, I, I, I think we're past the point of both, both sides-ism on climate change. In other words, one of the, one of the problems in the, in, the, in the 90s was that even though there was this robust scientific consensus, people felt obligated to go to the um, often paid mouthpieces of the fossil fuel industry for the alternative view. Um, and that was a way of successfully muddying the message and implying there wasn't a scientific consensus when the scientific consensus has been about as robust as the consensus that the earth is round. Um, and and so I think most journalists have now learned that, you know, um, if somebody, you know, comes from the, the Heartland Institute, which is a Koch brothers funded um, denial, Grendel's desk of Grendel's den of denialism is what I call it in the book. Um, you know, you're not going to get honest science. It's, um, you, you know, it, and, and so looking to the sources for when you um, try to tease out the complexities of initial and, and in, uh, of an issue um, is incredibly important. Um, another piece of advice is uh, study science. Um, I mean, it is a scientific, it's a very complex scientific issue. It's very hard to understand. And a lot of the problems in early journalism was I think the journalists would be assigned to this desk and they had no background in the science and with us uh, easily manipulated. Um, it's important to understand the science. This is a, a profoundly important issue for the age. And if you don't understand the science, you're not likely to get it right. And the science is indeed complex. Um, another is, uh, I really jump, wish- I just want to yeah. jump in on, on that exact note to, to a little advertisement that at the Center on Global Energy Policy, we hold every year a, a, a one week uh, energy journalist um, program where we mm -hmm. provide um, training and, or, or in, in briefings on a variety of energy related topics, including everything we're discussing today. So if there are any journalists listening who are interested in that, please check out our website and, and uh, we, we, we'd like to help with that. Good. Um, I have a we have a question from uh, Ken, Ken Joby who says, ask whether you think car carbon tax is a good idea for addressing climate change. Well, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> this, this is a lead into something where you and I may not agree, uh, David. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, carbon taxes um, are the, the least bureaucratic way of actually putting the price of carbon in. Um, here's a figure for you, 90% of, uh, fossil fuel emissions go into the atmosphere without paying any price whatsoever for their environmental things. Like uh, 8.7 million deaths a year from uh, air pollution, according to a British study. Um, that ought to, you know, that, those deaths are directly attributable uh, largely to fossil fuel emissions. But, and so uh, we've underpriced carbon um, for decades, ever since the beginning um, by not taxing it. And of course, but the carbon tax is the easiest thing to demonize, unfortunately. And um, back when, um, in the, one of the early days of the Clinton administration, um, they wanted to have a BTU tax. You probably were around for that and saw the organized blowback from everybody that made it the, basically a third rail of politics to talk about a carbon tax. I think it's a great idea. My idea, um, and it's, I mean, I, I feel like we need to do things now. Um, and we, we have to do them globally. We can't have free riders like China and India and other developing countries making up and exceeding our emissions when we try to lower them. And it, everybody's in this together. Um, and uh, what I propose is a universal carbon tariff um, that would only lay on, lie on nations that um, don't lower their emissions on an annual basis because we can't just cease growing. We have to actually lower emissions. Um, 
And uh, if you did lower your emissions, say by 3% a year, you would have no tax. Uh, and the reason I argue for this is that whatever we do, it has to be universal. Secondly, it has to be simple. What we've seen out of 26 Congress of Parties and six uh, assessments is that those who would delay action love to negotiate and they love complexity because it gives them innumerable opportunities to gum up the works. So it has to be simple. Um, otherwise it'll be gained also. And you can't start negotiating exceptions and things like that. Um, and then the third ask, the third design feature I would say is whatever we do has to be deployable rapidly. And that is something uh, my universal tariff could be deployed uh, by the, the World Trade Center, or the World um, Trade Organization has said they wanna get involved with climate. Great, get involved, let's do something like that. Um, I also argue that because we're likely to see piecemeal uh, carbon tariffs from the EU and other nations, that once that threatens to actually happen, and that could be very soon, um, most nations are going to say, gee, it would be better off if it was all universal, because then you can't use it for comparative advantage. You're, you're right. I'm not sure we do agree about this, Eugenia. My concern about about this is uh, should a rich nation have the same tariff as a poor nation? Should you know Germany, the United States, have the same emissions reduction obligation as you know I, I don't know Mali or um, uh, a country at the bottom end of development that hasn't had the chance to develop? How, how would you think about that for your? Well, I, I, I do think about that, and I think that <clears throat> most of the developed nations have optimized for energy efficiency. Most of the developing nations have not. And that's a freebie. And not only that, it pays for itself. And then secondly, the tariffs collected um, could be redistributed to help the poor nations meet their goals. So I think that, that I, I think uh, there's a, a ready mechanism for that. It's already been used for other things. And uh, um, yeah, I, for instance, uh, we talk about China sometimes, the largest emitter by far. China has more carbon emissions than the EU and the G20 combined. Um, it also is one of the least energy efficient economies in the world. Energy efficiency pays for itself. That's why we've gotten, uh, Amory Levin says we've had 30 times the uh, reductions in emissions from energy efficiency than we have from renewables from 1995. That's gonna change because renewables are now deploying rapidly. But it's true that um, energy efficiency has been so popular because for households it lowers costs and for businesses it increases profits. And China could easily make um, um, uh, uh, achieve uh, goals for the next several years just through energy efficiency alone, even without um, uh, further deploy of renewables. We have a number of questions about plastics, actually, and, and I think prompted by your reference to that. And, and maybe just you know, for, the, for people who are not familiar with this issue, maybe could you say a word about the relation between plastics production and climate change? And then plastics is a larger environmental problem, kind of given your vast knowledge on this. Any, any <laughs> the topic? Uh, you know, I mean, if, if, you know, petrochemicals go into plastics. I mean, they're a central ingredient of it. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, just in the manufacture of it, it's a, it's a, it's a major thing. Uh, a bigger problem, of course, is uh, these sort of uh, the ocean. Uh, they, they're, they, 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 they're very few things that eat plastics, and that's a problem. Um, they found bacteria some places and things like that, but they tend to be immortal. And um, they also tend, they can disrupt, uh, uh, they break down into uh, down to the molecular level and then they get into animals and um, they become hormone stimulators. And so you, you get all these bizarre effects at the ecosystem level. Um, they get there now, people are finding microplastics in our bloodstreams. And then of course they get pulled by the ocean currents into the oceans. and um, are killing a lot of seabirds and a lot of marine mammals and other animals um, as, uh, the, you know, as something as innocuous as plastic lighters are killing uh, albatross by the tens of thousands. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, they're a huge environmental problem at every level. And the scariest thing for me, is, of course, is at the hormonal level where you really can't, have, you can't avoid them as they get dispersed through the system. So there's reasons we need to migrate away from plastics um, or choose the basis, uh, change the basis. For instance, you can make a corn-based plastic, for instance, that it has uh, fewer of the attributes, the dangerous attributes. So it's a huge problem. And it's, a, it, it's tangentially a climate change problem. Um, I think there are <clears throat> a lot of big things that we can do 
that could we could do right now that would uh, give us a chance to get out of this mess that don't have to do with plastics. <laughs> well, let's cut, well, maybe we'll close with this, but that, we just have a lot of really interesting questions here. Um, uh, Richard uh, Serpranant um, says, some environmentalists demonize carbon capture and storage. What's your advice to resolve the demonizing of carbon capture and storage as a response to solving the climate crisis? Um, show that it works um, and, and that it isn't uh, a problem in its own right. For instance, um, there's some uh, company um, that is trying to take carbon out of the atmosphere, combine it with calcium into th synthetic limestone that can then be used to make aggregate and concrete. And concrete is a huge, huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So that's one way of capturing uh, carbon. And that's billions of tons a year that could, that, that could be captured. Another way, of course, is reforestation. Um, the, uh, when done right, um, can capture a lot of things and also help restore ecosystems. Um, I mean, uh, uh, stopping illegal for, uh, uh, deforestation um, in Brazil, uh, for instance, they could meet any kind of reduction, uh, meaning a reasonable reduction just through stopping illegal deforestation. Um, and something they ought to be doing anyway. But I, you know, I, I think carbon capture um, uh, can be used and will be used in the coming years. It's gonna, we're gonna have to do everything. We have to be open-minded about this because the, we cannot let happen where we're going, the three degree warming, which is, that's actually 2.7 to 3.7 degrees Celsius are the estimates of the warming that will happen by 2100 if everybody abides by the Paris Agreement, which is absurd. We can't get there. That is, and so we have to consider everything. Um, it might even, well, all right, we don't have to get into nuclear, but. Well, we had a question <laughs> about that. This is going to your voluminous knowledge on these topics, uh, uh, Eugene. And, and Bruce Lefkin asked if, if you have an opinion on nuclear, uh, on fusion in particular. Any, oh, any... Well, I'd love to see fusion happen. Um, and uh, I'd love to see it happen. I mean, we've been hearing about it forever. Um, and we don't know about the cost per kilowatt hour when it does happen, um, given all this many billions. I've known, I know of a couple of fusion projects that cost billions and didn't go anywhere. Um, I do, um, and this gives me my opening to talk about what I consider one of the most promising, and not to use the overused uh, cliche, game-changing things on the horizon, and it's a very near-term horizon, which comes out of fusion tech research, and that is the promise of deep geothermal. Um, and um, between five and 12 miles down and more on, in the Earth's crust, you have an almost infinite, for our purposes, source of heat that's 400 to 500 degrees Celsius, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, far higher than most surface geothermals. Um, the problem has been is that when you get between five and 12 miles down, you hit what's called basement rock, which is granite and basalt that's five to 10 times harder than sedimentary rock, which uh, oil drillers can go through like butter. Um, so a group out of MIT um, is commercializing their uh, millimeter wave beam technology. What they use the millimeter wave beam technology for is to try and create plasmas in the, in the, in the lab. And those are hundred million degrees. What they could be used for is to vaporize rock. Um, and uh, they've been vaporizing rocks in the lab at MIT uh, since 2007. Um, a company has been uh, formed to has, with a worldwide license to commercialize this technology for deep drilling. They argue, the company, I've talked to the CEO, they've argued that they can drill through the hardest rock down to that deep geothermal level in 100 days. The key, the interesting thing about this is that 60% of the electricity in the United States is produced by steam powered turbines. You could retrofit every one of those turbines to a different source of uh, steam, whether, and, and you could replace fossil fuels. 75 or 80% of the electricity in the world is produced by steam powered turbines. This company will have a pilot project up and running next year and hope to have two wells done in 2024. They don't need any technological breakthroughs. It really is a logistical problem, which is not inconsiderable, by the way, of delivering these micro millimeter wave beam technology down five to 
miles or more. So they're teaming with conventional drilling technology. The CEO of the company spent 15 years as a uh, chief driller for a major uh, uh, oil drilling company. Um, and the MIT plasma uh, uh, micro, uh, millimeter wave beam uh, technologists. Um, and uh, they argue that they can produce electricity um, if for a greenfield plant, like one to three cents per kilowatt hour, for a retrofit, less than a penny to a penny and a half cents for a kilowatt hour, cheaper than any other source of electricity around today. And in, if it, they prove this technology in 2024, um, anybody, they can, anybody can do it. Of course, they'd have to work with them or license it. But I mean, this could be done at scale. Consider the scale of that thing. That's terawatts of, uh, uh, of electricity that could be carbon free in a matter of a few years. Um, and to me, that is the most exciting thing on the horizon. Well, we are, we're down to our last three minutes or so, and, and uh, that maybe that just sets up my last question, but let me, let me just combine two questions, Eugene. First, we, we have a comment from uh, Ken Walgamoth, who was a, um, uh, a student of Wally Brucker's at Columbia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and says some nice things about, about Wally. M maybe just you know, say a word about the, the research that Wally did at Columbia and how that was uh, important for climate change. And, and then maybe just then final question um, we got is, is, is what in your research gives you hope and and you just gave us and it seems like that's a good place, <laughs> that seems like that's a good place to end you just gave us one technology that gives you hope but maybe just a word about wally and then yeah you know, absolutely it gives you well, hope he, you know he was one of my heroes because uh, i i understand i met him and interviewed him a few times but i understand he was a tough guy um and as george woodwell said it's easy to make enemies in science but he championed the idea of rapid climate change long before anybody else was on the train. Um, and uh, he was tough enough to stick by his guns. Um, and he understood the role of the oceans um, in, uh, in modulating climate. Um, and his, you know, he also championed the great ocean conveyor um, you know, and its role in warming Europe and um, how uh, changes in that could bring about a very rapid change in climate change, um, much more rapid than anybody knew at the time. Um, and so I think he was, he was, he maybe is one of the central figures in the climate change story of the last five decades. Um, he died just a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think if anything, um, almost everything he did was vindicated, uh, by subsequent events. So he was, he was way ahead of his time. I think he began to have his ideas about rapid change back when he was a graduate student way back in the fifties or. And so uh, it, it's quite, he had an extraordinary life and extraordinary contribution to science. What well, gives me hope, I mean, yes, that, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I'll, I'll use the example of COVID and I'll be brief on this. And that is that um, it's a negative example because what it shows is that once um, an issue becomes politicized, um, facts don't matter, only the messenger. And if the messenger is deemed illegitimate, um, you're never going to get through with the facts. And so people are dying of the disease and still denying it exists. The same to prove true. And it's one of the problems we're dealing with with, uh, with uh, climate change is that once the messenger is deemed illegitimate, it doesn't really matter. The positive side of COVID, however, is that I think the last vaccine took seven years from uh, development to approval. We did a vaccine on COVID in a year. It's just an absolutely extraordinary event. And it shows what can happen when the global community is all working together on the same problem with the resources to do it. Um, one of the positive things that's happening right now is resources are flowing into climate related issues, into the technologies and into the science and everything else. And so with the resources are there and the COVID vaccine thing, I mean, I consider deep geothermal, for instance, to be a vaccine for climate change. And, um, it, and hopefully it'll have the same time frame. Eugene, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us today. Eugene Linden's new book, um, Fire and Flood. Let's see it. Here it is. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's available uh, at bookstore near you and, and I am Amazon. I highly recommend it. Um, as we mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available online at the Center on Global Energy Policy website uh, soon, within the next few days.
Uh, for those of you in the New York City area, we're hosting a, a Women in Energy Networking reception uh, this Monday evening, April 11th. Uh, our, our website has details. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please join me in giving uh, Eugene Lennon a big virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. I enjoyed it. Have a great day. Take care, Thank everyone. You.